Uh, welcome, welcome back, family Bible time. We are having fun already and we haven't even started. So what a day we have today. Psalm 25, 29, 33, 36, 39. And all of that while the day is just beginning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, please pour out your blessing upon our reading of your word. Please teach us, speak to us, help us, lead us. Um, help us to understand your word, Lord. Please change us by it. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Well, this is David in the deep end, Psalm 25. Um, a Psalm of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall, wanton, they shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. This is, you could say, part one of the psalm. There are actually, I think, ten lessons in this psalm for surviving the deep end. Do you remember that sermon? Uh, you can find a sermon of mine somewhere uh, on ten lessons to survive the deep end. And the first lesson in these first verses is just to lift up your soul to God. What's it like um, when you're out of your depth, when, you're, when troubles abound, when suddenly you're surrounded by difficulty and you, you, you feel like, I'm, I'm out of my depth, I can't cope with this. Number one, lift up your soul to God. That's what David did. Number two, ask God to teach you in the deep end. Here we go, verse four. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. So Lord, here I am. Um, what does it mean to lift up your soul to God, to kind of bring yourself to God, saying, Lord, I'm here, help. <laughs> and now, please teach me whilst I'm in trouble. Number three, verse six, ask God to remember you differently. Remember your mercy, O God, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions according to your steadfast love. According to your steadfast love, remember me, for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. So what's David saying? Lord, I'm in trouble. Maybe I'm being disciplined. O Lord, please don't remember my sins. Remember your steadfast love. Remember your chesed. Remember your commitment to loving me. So you're asking God to remember you differently. Number four, remind yourself of God's ways with his children. This is what David's doing now, verse 8 and 9 and 10. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right. He teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. So you're saying, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spell out what, um, you've got it, have you? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to spell out, I'm going to remind myself, I'm going to articulate, I'm going to say out loud what God is like. Good and upright is the Lord. This is so helpful, isn't it? Do you, you, if you're following with us through these family Bible times, and if you're a member of our family, you always hear your parents say, and sometimes you hear your wife say, and sometimes you hear your hubby say, now speak truth to yourself. Talk truth to yourself. You, you, you say that occasionally, don't you? It's wonderful to have a reminder. Talk truth to yourself. Did I say that to you just yesterday? I think I did, yes. 
talk truth to yourself. What, what kind of truths do you need to talk to yourself? Sometimes you need to tell yourself. Um, I, I've, I've sometimes asked you to tell me, when Donna said, what, what can I do for you? How can I help you? I so, said, well, just tell me to stop feeling sorry for myself and get on with it. <laughs> Sometimes you just want to kind of, you need to hear, if you had a sergeant major shouting at you, um, come on, you can do it, get up, you lazy toad. You would get up, you would actually do it. So sometimes you need to tell yourself, um, stop feeling sorry for yourself and get on with it. But in this case, it's, it's, it's expressing the way God deals with his children. Why? Because sometimes we can doubt. We can forget and be led by our circumstances to think that God is somehow not good and that somehow his paths are, 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 are not faithful and kind and loving. Well, okay, well, you need to say this. Say it out loud. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. This is so helpful, isn't it? Number five, ask forgiveness. Verse 11. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. I think this is the heart of the psalm. Um, the heart of the psalm is, I fear him. Lord, please forgive me. I, 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 I just, I'm going to have to ask you for forgiveness. So it's interesting, a bit like with the Lord's Prayer. The forgiveness doesn't always come straight up front, does it? The request for forgiveness. And I think sometimes when we put that front, we, f we can forget God's character and then get stuck in just worrying about our sins. But Lord, Lord, for your name's sake, O oh Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. That's a straight up prayer for forgiveness. Number six, um, verse 12, remind yourself how God treats those who fear him. Uh, who, is the, who is the man who fears the Lord? Him will he instruct in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship of the Lord is for those who, what does it say? Fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. He makes known to them his covenant. Isn't that good? Remind yourself how God treats those who fear him. Number seven, commit yourself to trusting only in God. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Isn't that interesting? Again, there's this declaration, this, this statement. Sometimes, um, if you're frightened, if you're, let's say, standing on top of a very tall place and you're scared because of the height and you don't want to step one foot in front of another, sometimes it's good to talk truth to yourself and to say, I can do this. I've just done it. I can do this. Okay, I, I, I can manage this. Sometimes you have to do something more than that. You actually have to tell yourself to do it. Come on, step. <laughs> And when, when, when your dad's coaching you, sometimes you'll have your dad say, ready, one, two, three, step. <laughs> go on, put one foot in front of the other. You can do it. Now, now go. That's what I do to the dog sometimes to get her into the lake. Go on. And she goes. And sometimes you just, we just need that encouragement. This is, this is verbally committing yourself to trusting the Lord. I, my eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he will pluck my feet out of the net. I'm going to do this. Verse 8, spell out your anguish and cry for help. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. This is David now 
telling God how he feels and crying out for help. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. Consider how many are my foes and with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let, let me not be put to shame for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. This is David now, just kind of pouring out his soul and his troubles to the Lord, which we can do, can't we? Just like I say to you, tell me all about it. Or to you. <laughs> tell me all about it. Come on, tell me everything. Tell me what's going on. And I want to know, does God want to know? Is God willing to listen to you, to your, your troubles, your, what, what's on your heart? God is, isn't he? He's not just willing to listen. This is an example for us to encourage us to do this, to spell out our anguish, what's troubling you, and cry for help. Just call to him. Now, verse, uh, verse 22, number 9. Pray for the rest of God's people. This is David. He's got lots of troubles, hasn't he? But he's not just focused on himself. Look at this. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Well, there we are. That was 9 out of 10 lessons on surviving the deep end in Psalm 25. Oh, 9 out of 10, that means that there's 10. Number 10 still to go. What's number 10? We run out of verses. How can there be a number 10? Well, number 10 comes from the fact that this psalm in Hebrew is an acrostic. What's, what's an acrostic? It's not anything like a stick that's annoyed. <laughs> An acrostic. <laughs> that would be if Aidy was chewing. <laughs> An acrostic is a poem, or in this case, a psalm that starts every verse with a new letter of the alphabet. Um, but like, I went to the market and I bought. Okay, that um, that's kind of finishing it with a new letter of the alphabet, but in. In, uh, in an acrostic, everything starts with a new, the, the next letter of the alphabet. And that's in Hebrew, that's what this psalm looks like, if you could read Hebrew. So that means it's kind of written to help us remember, why would David do that? Why would David spend time? Think about it. He's been in trouble, hasn't he? I mean, this has been David in the deep end. This has been David feeling in, in desperate need. And why would he then why would he then write a psalm about it? He said, well, that's what David did. He wrote psalms. Well, actually, why would he make it memorable like that? An acrostic. Well, I, I, I think it's for this reason. I'm, I'm going to say number 10 is the 10, 10th lesson is to treasure the treasure of the trial. Here's David and he's been through a trial and he's learned something from it and he's cried out to the Lord. This is the poetic expression of the whole thing, isn't it, for him? And so what's David doing here? David is, is remembering, he's memorizing, you would say, the lessons he learned from the trial. And we should when we go through the deep end, we should really be careful not to forget the lessons we learned. How many times in our marriage have we had to say, oh, we've been here before. Oh, why didn't we learn this last time? And it's so helpful, isn't it? If you, I mean, some people journal. Um, I've never done it. I really, I really kind of wish I had many times. Some people journal because they want to record the, the lessons that they are learning from God. 
And over the years, you've kept a number of journals, haven't you? And it's very interesting to read back through those, and, and as you do from time to time, and you're like, I remember this. And there's great lessons that we learned years ago, which I tend to forget and you tend to remember. There we are. So that was Psalm 25, David in the Deep End. Ten lessons on surviving the deep end from David. Praise the Lord for that. Now, um, my phone has switched to saying good morning to me instead. Psalm 29, 29. Another Psalm of David. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Do you do this? Do you, when you're walking and you see something wonderful, do you ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name? Do you tell out the praises? Do you say that that shows God's glory? Now, if you painted a very nice picture, or if you played a beautiful piece of music like the Moonlight Sonata, what do you want? You want someone to, if someone's looking at it, or someone's listening to it, you want them to listen to it and, and to recognize that you did that, don't you? So, hold on a moment. God made everything beautiful. We walk through his world. And some people just walk through his world just kind of looking at their phone um, all the time or looking at the ground. Lift up your eyes and look at the creation. And I'm going to say this. When you see the wonder of God's world, ascribe glory to God. T -t -t speak it out. Lord, you are wonderful. What have you done? This is amazing. Um, that's right, isn't it? Verse 3. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon to skip like a calf and Syrian like a long, young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. That's a lot of Fs, isn't it? Flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice shake the Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. <laughs> God say that. <laughs> Anyway, the voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth. It's always puzzled me. I've always kind of thought, and if you take that literally, it's like <laughs> the Lord shouts and whoop, whoops. <laughs> anyway, so probably not. It's best to interpret this poetically, isn't it? And strips the forest bare, and in his temple all cry glory. Can, can you say, that? look, look. This is what the psalmist David is saying. He's saying, look, God is the one who's making all this stuff happen. It's the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord that, that does all these amazing things. And in his temple, in, in heaven, all cry glory. Look, they are watching what God has done. And they are ascribing glory to him, aren't they? And do you know what? When we do the same, we're just joining in the worship of heaven. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. That's the only prayer in this psalm, isn't it? it there's a lot of instruction for us. But it's really helpful sometimes. Do you want me to say this for your prayers? It's really, really helpful for your prayers to spend time ascribing glory to God. And when you come to this prayer at the end, you'll be full of faith. 
This is nothing for God to do. Lord, strengthen your people today. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Isn't this good? Psalm 33. You're already there. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits his people. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Play piano music to the Lord. Well, that's kind of what it says, isn't it? I mean, it says, it says a harp of ten strings. But look, this is, this is say, talking about playing music to the, for the Lord. Sing to him. A new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. No wonder they had a choir master and a music director. Because you need help, don't you? Uh, to do this well. <clears throat> For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. Just by the way, this is just not a picture of billions of years of evolution, is it? This is God spoke and it happened, which is exactly what we read in Genesis. Anyway, verse 10, the Lord brings counts, the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples for you. I'm glad about that. <laughs> right now I'm thinking, this is very good. Because there's some wicked plans going on. Um, and and we, can, we could trust in this, couldn't we? Could you take some comfort today, believer? I tell you, if you spend your time on the internet researching conspiracy theories, um, you'd be full of fear. Absolutely full of fear. But if you spend your time in the Bible researching the power and the sovereignty of God, you'll be full of faith instead. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. Think of it. God is watching you. God is watching me. He's watching. He's looking. A king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. I'm just going to say we ought to memorize these words, had we not? This, the, this, this is a psalm that will put your fear to flight. This is a psalm that will stop you from turning to the, the vain methods of man to try to fight God's battles. This is a psalm that will keep you trusting in the Lord and thinking... Um, I, I need his help above everything else. What I do is write verses like this, or type them, 
and print them out large and stick them on my wall in front of my in front of my desk so that I can look at them and they remind me that it's what's more important than anything else um, is to trust in the Lord. The eyes of the Lord roam to and fro throughout the earth uh, and to give strong support to those to the one whose heart is uh, steadfast toward him or something like that. No, I should have it memorized and I just exposed my <laughs> just exposed my failure. Um, this is stuff that we should know, isn't it? Because it helps us. Verse 20, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Praise the Lord. Psalm 36. You're there already. I see it. I see that smile. Psalm 36. To the choir master. They had a choir master. <laughs> of David, the servant of the Lord. This is a different psalm, isn't it? Transgression speaks to the wicked deep in his heart. There is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flatters himself in his own eyes that his iniquity cannot be found out and hated. The words of his mouth are trouble and deceit. He has ceased to act wisely and do good. He plots trouble while on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not reject evil. Wow, there's a description of the wicked person, isn't there? Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light do we see light. Oh, continue your steadfast love to those who know you, and your righteousness to the upright of heart. Let not the foot of arrogance come upon me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. The, there the evildoers lie fallen. They are thrust down, unable to rise. Now, Psalm 39, 39, and this is where we finish for the day. It's a shame, isn't it? But we have to get on with the day as well. Psalm 39, to the choir master, to Jeduthun, a psalm of David. I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle, so long as the wicked are in my presence. I, I was mute and silent. I held my peace to no avail. And my distress grew worse. My heart became hot within me. As I mused, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue, O oh Lord. Make me know my end and what is the measure of my days. Let me know how fleeting I am. Behold, you have made my days a few handbreadths, and my lifetime is as nothing before you. Surely all mankind stands as a mere breath. Selah. Surely a man goes about as a shadow. 
Surely for nothing they are in turmoil. Man heaps up wealth and does not know who will gather. And now, O Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not let me, do not make me the scorn of the fool. I am mute. I do not open my mouth, for it is you who have done it. Remove your stroke from me. I am spent by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Surely all mankind is a mere breath. Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Hold not your peace at my tears. For I am a sojourner with you, a guest, like all my fathers. Look away from me that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. Well, I'm going to say this is a psalm of David when he realizes that he's being disciplined. In the heart of the psalm, verse 8, deliver me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of the fool. But verse 10 shows you that David is aware who, who is disciplining him or where the trouble is coming from. Remove your stroke from me. It reminds me of Psalm 32. Remember in Psalm 32 when David said, um, when I kept silent, verse 3, my strength was dried up as by the, my, by the heat of summer. My my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as with the heat of summer. Selah, that's Psalm 32. It's David describing what it's like when God is against you. Spurgeon put it like this. Uh, the hand, of, the hand of the Lord is most wonderful when it holds a believer up, but it is most terrible when it presses a believer down. Mm. Day and night your hand was heavy upon me, said David. Here he says, remove your stroke from me. I'm spent. I'm, I'm exhausted by the hostility of your hand. When you discipline a man with rebukes for sin, you consume like a moth what is dear to him. Once upon a time, Donna bought me a lovely cardigan for Christmas. And then suddenly it was full of holes and ruined. And it's so interesting, isn't it? I think the Lord himself sometimes takes precious things from us. Like That's what it says here. You consume like a moth what is dear to him. He takes precious things from us as a discipline for our sin. Yeah, now, you'll see this in your own conscience if you're a believer. You'll see the Lord dealing with you in this way, like he dealt with David, like he deals with every believer. If anyone was, is without discipline, Hebrews 12 says, you're not, you don't belong to God but don't belong to God, but he disciplines those he loves. And we should fear this, shouldn't we? Um, it's also very, very helpful to, to, to realize that this is, this, is David, this is David being taught by God through his discipline, isn't it? So David... David says, I, I, I'm going to just, I'm going to take this, I'm going to be silent, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fight it, but Lord, please have mercy upon me. Please, please remove your stroke from me. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my cry, hold not your peace at my tears. Uh, and Look away from me that I may smile again. Lord, give me 
quickly some relief from this discipline. These are the cries of someone who's, who's realizing that he's a sinner, that he deserves it, but this is hard. Isn't it wonderful that we can take those kind of cries to the Lord? Father, today we pray that you would help us to walk before you and to live before you in righteousness, in fear of you, in love of you. Lord, help us to fear your discipline, to love you for your, your kindness to us and mercy. Please teach us and train us, whether we're in the deep end or whether we're in discipline. Lord, please lead us in your paths for your name's sake. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We will see you again tomorrow. You're going to be here tomorrow. Keep on going. Look, we're nearly halfway through the year. It's crazy, isn't it? We're roaring through the Bible. We'll be back tomorrow. Until then, bye.